My subject is in three parts. The watchman, the warning, and the storm. Said with me, the watchman, the warning, and the storm. I want to talk about some lessons learned from the tsunami. Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. Ezekiel 33 and 1. And again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him up for a watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. And that is the watchman. Now let's go listen to a warning. Isaiah 26. 26 chapter of Isaiah and... The 20th verse. I'm not following my own, my own Bible here. Oh, come my people. Enter into thy chamber. Shut the door. Hide yourself. As it were, for a little woman for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for the iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. The warning. Now let's go to the storm. Isaiah 29 and 6. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. A few weeks ago, one of the worst storms in human history took place in Indonesia, killing over 200,000 people. But worse then the death of those people was the discovery they didn't have to die. The heavy loss of life was because there was no warning system. There was no person with the equipment, the training, and the responsibility of watching and warning. It, it's a possibility, some have suggested, that the person with the responsibility, because there had been no storm, stopped watching. But the question the whole world is asking is, who warned the animals? Who warned the deer, the goat, the lamb, the dog, the cat, the rabbit? There's an important revelation about the sovereignty of God that we can glean from the storm. A lot of times when you pray, you are asking God to do something, but the problem you're praying about, he has already prearranged for. 
A storm is something God created in nature to protect environment. God created storm. Whenever the earth's weather becomes threatening, whenever uh, the ground goes too long without rain, whenever a large body of water is about to be displaced as it was with the tsunami, God sends a storm to regulate. We hate a storm, and as bad as a storm is, it is there to regulate, to bring balance, to restore balance. Are you hearing me? You can't do anything about a storm. That's the one thing that's not in your ability to start or stop. The storm is God's independent action. There was a woman sitting next to a preacher on a plane during a very violent storm. The woman looked at the preacher frightened to death and asked, can't you do something about this? The preacher looked at the woman and said, Madam, I'm in sales, not upper management. <laughs> storm. Storm is when upper management takes over. But whereas you can't stop a storm, if you are warned, you can avoid a storm, go around a storm, fly over a storm, or just don't go where the storm is. But storms that regulate the environment are not the only storms of life. Every once in a while, God will send a different type of storm to regulate the moral and spiritual extremity of life. When evil becomes too prevalent, when the bad outweighs the good, when Satan gets a foothold where his foot has no business being, when the evil majority becomes too much greater than the godly minority, then when, when evil reaches our political, social, and religious institution, then God has a way of saying to his people, step back and let me regulate. Now, if this were not true, Noah would have never had the flood. Sodom and Gomorrah would still be standing. There would have been no Red Sea. Goliath would have won the fight. The Hebrew boys would have died in the furnace. There would be no resurrection. The Christian church would still be persecuted. The French aristocracy would still be murdering their subjects. The South would have won the war. Hitler would have died of old age. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks would have never ended up in the same city. Mandela would have died in jail. But makes periodic visits. Am I correct, someone? Always he intercedes when evil lasts too long. I'm trying to move on, but this is why after you've prayed and preached, your next commandment is to wait. The Old Testament prophets were like spiritual weathermen. Their job was not to forecast good and bad weather, but to warn you when your actions were offensive to God. They were moral storm watchers. And they did not let the pressure of society make them social servants. They kept their watch. Is anyone hearing me? We hear Isaiah saying, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. First chapter, second verse. For the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know my people, doth not consider, O sinful nation, 
people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, meaning your dad was bad and now you are bad. <laughs> Children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Isaiah is putting his people on storm alert. Isaiah 26, come my people, enter into thy chambers, shut thy door, hide yourself for a little moment, because God got some business to take care of. Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood. There would be so much less tragedy in our lives if there was less preaching about prosperity and more storm warnings. Many of our decisions we would not have made. Many of our loved ones would have stopped their evil if somebody had have just given them the right message. If somebody would have just said the wages of sin is death. And whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Am I correct, somebody? The high escalating rate of divorce, the, the tsunami of divorce, means somebody has stopped watching. Am I correct, somebody? We do people a terrible disservice when you give them smooth sayings when they need a storm warning. I did Samantha the other day and realized every person will have in 600 years one million descendants. Every individual in 600 years, that's two per every 30 years, will have one million descendants, which means whatever you do, most likely one million people will make the same choice. It is understandable what Isaiah says, says, cry loud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Let's be honest, many of us are saved today because somebody gave us a convincing storm warning. Now, any good weatherman will consult with other weather bureaus to learn if a storm is coming. If the Detroit Weather Center wants to know if there's a storm coming in their direction, they will contact the Chicago Weather Center to determine the velocity and direction of the storm. It is a fact that we now realize if the weather center in Indonesia had have just consulted with Honolulu who said they knew of the tsunami an hour and a half before it happened. The reason that Isaiah and Jeremiah knew Judah was headed for disaster was because they had in front of them the library of Amos and Hosea. <laughs> Isaiah was a reader. You can get prophecy from reading. Am I correct, someone? And, 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 and they had, and, and, and Isaiah was 55 years old when Israel fell. And so he, he, he saw that. And so Isaiah, I, he, I don't know if, if, I don't know how, how flashy his revelation was, but Isaiah just simply concluded that if Judah do what Israel did, they are going to have the same problem. Isaiah saw how Israel became so arrogant with prosperity until Israel decided, are you all with me? Israel decided they didn't need God, became very loose, and they even included prostitution in their, uh, uh, in their worship. So Isaiah said, they did it, you do it, you won't have a storm. It would seem that somebody ought to look at what sin did to somebody else and get a storm warning for their own lives. Am I right, somebody? 
I got saved at 16. Sin didn't have a chance with me because until God saved me, my mother did. I'll explain that at another time. I didn't get saved because of what sin did to me, but I saw what it did to others. Am I right, somebody? It would seem as a nation, we ought to get a storm warning from just looking at the history of other nations. Look like me, George Bush would have learned from Nixon and Nixon would have learned from Hitler and Hitler would have learned from Mussolini and Mussolini would have learned from Napoleon and Napoleon would have learned from Caesar and Caesar from Alexander that sin is a reproach against any people. And the way of the transgressor is hard. Any government that puts the wealth in the hands of a few and the majority of the people suffer in poverty and oppression is doomed to failure. It's a sociological fact. Wealth breeds religious complacency. Religious complacency breeds moral indifference and moral indifference breeds moral corruption. And when a nation becomes bankrupt, their economy always suffers. It would seem, and I need your prayers, that as a religious denomination, we should get a storm warning from looking at the rise and fall of other denominations. Soldiers of God, we need to ask ourselves, how does a denomination that was created 250 years ago with such a noble purpose, pulled from their mother institution for the purpose of developing a holy nation. How does that denomination change that in 250 years over half the constituency vote to make homosexuality legal? a decision they would not have made 50 years ago. Can you imagine your great, great grandchildren comprising the General Assembly and voting like that? Putting ashtrays in the women's lounge? And, and, and bars in the pastor study? Y'all don't hear me. Israel had to fight for their individuality. Am I correct, someone? They were surrounded by big bully nations and they had to fight for their identity. And the church of God in Christ cannot Take for granted who we are. The world is infectious. It has the power over a period of time to contaminate the purest of organizations. This is why when you join the church of God in Christ, you can't come in here telling us what to do. You can't come in here telling us who you are. You've got to find out what we are about. My mentor, Bishop Bethel Clemens, general board member, former Bishop of Eastern New York, had one agenda to tell us, don't forget your cultic roots. Am I correct, somebody? In 1886, Elder Mason and Elder C.B. Jones did not begin a Pentecostal movement. They began a holiness movement. Their first convention was called a holiness convention. The dispute that divided Jones from their church and they later got him kicked out was over the doctrine of holiness and sanctification. 
Their denomination believed it was impossible to live without sin. To quote Bishop Ithiel Clemens, they took the Calvinist position that the human condition apart from grace was truly hopeless and that a Christian's life would continue to exhibit sinfulness. Elder Jones and Elder Mason disagreed with this doctrine and introduced the Wesleyan perfectionist doctrine, which said we are justified by justification, we are saved from the guilt of sin and restored to the favor of God. By sanctification, we are saved from the power and root of sin and restored to the image of God. Bishop Mason and Jones believed in Christian perfection and preached continually from be ye perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. The experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost was a gift bestowed upon the believer to give him the power to live a holy life. I wish I had time because something I'd like to say about that. In the early years of the church, the emphasis was on being unspotted by the world. Their supreme goal was to show a difference between holiness and unholiness. The scripture they drove us crazy with, come out from among them, be separated, be not unequally yoked. Am I telling the truth? Be not conformed. Every time we breathe to turn around, the, the, the blessed is the man that walking not in the council of the, y'all know y'all hear it ringing in your mind. Men were discouraged to wear ties, women not to straighten their hair. They knew there was no sin in tie and hair, but they wanted to send a message. They wanted to protest worldliness. Am I correct somebody? By the time I was born in the 40s, and it's not important you know which part, <laughs> the rules had slightly changed, but the purpose was the same, to protect us from the corruption of the world. We couldn't do nothing. Come on, let's tell the truth. Couldn't play basketball, couldn't go to baseball game, couldn't bowl, couldn't golf, couldn't shoot pool, and couldn't go to the show, and bet not play marbles, because there's a verse in the Bible said, marvel not. <laughs> the emphasis was on prayer, as well as preaching. Sometimes tarry service took longer than the sermon. Am I telling the truth? They wouldn't let you leave there till you got something. Cause you wanted to go home and eat. You came up with something. Now, my generation has realized that trying to protect your children from the wickedness of the world by locking them up is really not effective. Because there's another enemy to the moral and ruin. Help me, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. There's another enemy to the moral and spiritual life of our youth. One more destructive than any nightclub. It does more harm than any dance hall. One more that does more ruin than running with a game. There's another enemy that has crept in all of our homes and has more potential to corrupt and destroy our youth than anything on this earth. It's in a central location in almost every room. Claims to be a source, help me, somebody. Claims to be a source of information and entertainment, but it's really Satan's way of smuggling into our home every form of wickedness imaginable. Through cable, it has the capacity to expose our children to every evil lifestyle. Statistics say the average home has three televisions on seven hours a day. To be blind to the power of television. 
It's like the story of the custom officer who sees a suspicious looking truck pulling up to the border. He orders the truck out, drive out and searches the truck. He pulls the panels and bumpers. He, 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 he goes into the, uh, under the seat. He's looking for some contraband and he can't find nothing. He gets upset and sent him on. And then next week, same driver drives up and he's so determined to catch him. He goes, are y'all with me? Goes under the truck and even cuts the tires trying to find contraband. Does this ritual for 20 years. Finally, he gives up, and after 20 years, he's about to retire. He said, I, I, I know you're crooked. He said, you just look crooked. And he said, I know you're smuggling something. Now, what in the world are you smuggling? He said, you can't go to jail. I'm fitting to quit. What are you smuggling? He said, trucks. He said, while you're busy looking for the drugs, you didn't miss the truck. And that's what's happening with the meter. While we are laughing at the joke, while we are enjoying the entertainment, the devil is smuggling into our living room every kind of weakness you can imagine. By the time soap operas finish with our youth, all our children will be young and restless and because of the guiding light, the days of their lives will end up in a general hospital because the drugs will make their world turn and they will not have but one life to live. It is a statistical effect and I'm almost through. It is a statistical fact that the high increase in violence and sexual promiscuity is linked to the media. Are you all hearing me? In the, uh, let me say to you, let me, in, with, with the help of God, let me put America on storm alert. Let me try to give the Church of God in Christ a storm warning. And I want to give you a glimpse of 2060. In 1940, only one out of every 10 Afro-American families were headed by single parent. Nine out of every 10 Afro-American families were married. By 1973, out of every 10, Afro-American families were headed by single adults. Seven were married. Now, 2003, six out of every 10 Afro-American families are headed by single adults. Only four out of every 10 families are married. Are y'all hearing me? Do I have to paint a picture about 2060? Are you all hearing me? The Bureau of Justice Statistics says, the Bureau of Justice Statistics says, the average black child born today will spend some of his adult years in prison. One half of all teenagers use drugs before finishing high school. Almost 50% of all school-aged children consume alcohol by the eighth grade. Almost 80% of them before they finish high school. It is proven that the youth today see sex as a game on the same level of hopscotch. Over the past 20 years, the age for sex has been getting younger and younger. It is now normal to find children 12 years old engaged in sex because of the need of two working parents in the home. Teenagers are receiving less parenting than ever before. Most of our teenagers come home to an empty house. 70% of the parents admit they know almost nothing about the online activities of their youth. About 60% of youth between the ages, are y'all with me? 60% of the youth between the ages of 11 and 14 visit adult chat room 
and pornographic websites. 60 years from the day, 90% of the children will have grown up in homes with absent fathers. Women's respect for men will be almost non-existent. Homosexuality will be an accepted life form. The church of God and Christ of the future will not be recognized by this generation. Marriage will be almost non-existent. Drugs will be legal. Man's respect for human life will be gone. Children will rise up against their parent 60 years to the day our society will almost be in ruins when a society is deteriorating that is not the time for the church of God in Christ to become liberal help me Holy Ghost when a society is down when a society am I telling the truth I'm almost through when a society is sick this is when you must become a peculiar people that's not the time to trade principle for popularity holy living for compromise prayer for playing shut-ins for picnic Gospel preaching for entertainment, spirituality for carnality, sincerity for hypocrisy, being spirit filled for being feeling good. We are the salt of the earth. We are all that God has. We are the light of the world. They are not our light. We are their light. I've got to close. Bishop Patterson, I, I can't offer but one solution. We got to stop allowing the adult community to worry us to death. If we're going to counteract that future, we got to raise up another generation. I was praying. Is anyone hearing me? And, and, and I, you may not think this is a solution, but... But, but, but we are going to have to take the sunshine ban and the purity class and bring it out the ashes and restore it and invest in it. We, am I right somebody? We have got to raise up another generation of men that will not go to the bed until they bend to the altar. A man that will... Men that will marry and stay married. I got to close. We got to hold our clergy to strict standards. Even if we are not all that we should be, somebody need to call us to the side. That's why it's kind of nice to have a bishop in there. Kind of nice to have somebody you can call up and tell him, I need your prayer. I'm trying to help other folk, but I need you help me, Holy Ghost, to help me a little bit. Aren't y'all glad oh, why you would want to be under somebody who ain't under nobody? I will never understand. You ought to always want to be under somebody who's under somebody. Am I telling the truth? To me, Bishop Wright's one of the greatest men in the world and I can call him up and say, I got a, something to tell you privately and pray me and get me back where I ought to be. Am I right, somebody? We have got to, I'm, I'm about to close and this ain't gonna ever happen again so ain't nothing you can do about what I'm finna say. We have got to stop being stingy with the national church. I have observed in my old age that every leader we elect him, but we won't support him. We won't give him enough money for his vision. Bishop Mason had to take food out of his children's mouth. Am I correct somebody? 
Bishop Jones, Bishop J. O. Patterson went to heaven never seeing that AU Center built. Bishop, y'all don't like my message. Bishop Ford, Bishop Owens, I hear them and now we have one of the finest men of our time. I'm so impressed with that youth center, that place he just built. Help. Talk to me somebody, it's for young folk. It's, it's a place for them to run, a place for them to have fun. Don't you realize if you give this man all the money that he deserves, he can bring about a vision that will turn this world upside down. Am I telling the truth? I got to close. I've got to close. But after all I've said, after all I've said, there still is a storm. I need some help up here. Because as sure as I'm standing here, if the people don't hear the watchman after he's given the warning, there will be a storm. Am I right, somebody? Yes. About when my son was about nine or 10 years old, Bishop Patterson, he was the troublemaker of the school. I don't know why we get in so much trouble, but he was the troublemaker of the school. They couldn't have school for him. The teacher said, I'm trying to teach the class, he's trying to pass to the class. I tell him what to do, he tell me what to do. My wife couldn't stand for me to whoop my son. Uh, if I got ready to hit him, she grabbed my hand. If I came after him one time, she stood in front of me. So we tried punishment. We, we, we took the TV from him. We took the basketball. Help me, Holy Ghost. We took, we took, I even read a book on child psychology. None of it helped. And so finally, what I had to do, I got a call from the school. They said, come get him and don't you bring him back till you come back. I knew it was time for a storm. I told my wife, get out the house. Go shopping. Go to the mall, just don't spend much. Go. I told my wife, go to the mall. I told her, just go wherever you wanna go. There's gonna be a storm in this house. When my son got home, he ran through the door and he ran into the bedroom. Are y'all hearing me? And, and he, he shut the door and I ran behind him and kicked the door open. And he jumped across the bed and like Superman, I jumped across the bed. Then he ran and got behind a chair and I picked up the whole chair and threw it. All I can tell you is when the storm was over, he went back to school and got a certificate in good behavior. I was able to tell my wife, come on home, the storm is over. Any of y'all know what I'm saying? God told me to tell you today, the storm is almost over. He had to do what he had to do. If you want your daughters out the street, if you want your children off drugs, God had to have a storm in your life. I need some help up here. Somebody is going through a storm right now. You're wondering what did you do wrong? God told me to tell you, you ain't done nothing wrong. It's God that had to walk into your churches and straighten the mess out in your church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But God sent me all the way from Detroit by way of United Airlines all the way through Northwest to tell you one word the storm is almost over told me to tell you, tell you hey, my neighbor hang on a little while your, your storm is almost over tell your neighbor, neighbor they that way on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up. Whoa. Oh yes, they will. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Lay your hand on somebody and say, neighbor, I know what he told
talking about I've been there, I've been there, I've been there I know what it is to be in pain I know what it is to hurt I know what it is to have trouble in your eyes But they that way But I was listening to your song when you said you tried to take us back and I want to thank you for taking us back and you said I've seen the lightning flashing I heard the thunder roll I've seen breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me to go on somebody said he promised never to leave me never to leave me alone Let's make the devil mad. Look at three people and say, no. 